I'm sure that there are some among you who will be glad to know that we have just about finished 2 Corinthians. Matter of fact, this Wednesday in our chapter by chapter, verse by verse study, I think we'll make it to the end of the book, or at least that's the plan, is that we'll make it to the end of the book. Today, we're going to be working on uh, just these few verses, and then next Sunday we'll be We'll be pulling out of chapter 13, and, and we should have finished this one and can move on. The verses I have for you today are out of chapter 12, and they start in verse 6. These are the words of Paul, and it goes like this. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was giving a th- given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weaknesses. Hmm. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's stop there and pray for a moment. Lord, I thank you. We are weak. Please come and be strong today. Teach us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in your weakness. This is a verse all of us like to some extent because we all have weaknesses. And we like this promise that he'll come through and he'll be gracious at the moment that we're weak. Of all of the people who cling to this verse, I don't think anybody finds this verse more particularly poignant and necessary than the preacher's. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. You know, when we were down in Sweet Home, there was a young man that started coming to our church. He'd really never been to church before. And he started coming, a high school kid. And he would see me get up on Sunday morning. And you know, I don't have a stack of notes in front of me. So he figured I was just shooting from the hip. That I just, I just got up and, and just kind of just started talking. And whatever came out is what came out. And that was the end of it. And as he got to know our family better and better, he realized the amount of time that's invested in Bible studies and sermons, he was amazed at the amount of preparation that was involved. I want you to know that sometimes it's kind of fun. That's pretty easy. Sometimes I'm in a passage of Scripture as we go through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, that I've studied before, that I've preached out of before, that I really enjoy. There's some stories in there I really get into. And it's just, I, I sit down in front of my computer and man, I just rattle that thing out. It's great. Rare. Very rare. More common is Friday afternoon, I'm trying to pull this thing together knowing that I've got something, say a funeral, on Saturday. And I'm like, Lord, I, what, what even, what, what do you want here? One of my greatest mentors, Dr. Jerry Warren, I've talked about him quite a bit, he told me when I very first started to preach, that Sunday comes every week. I would, I would go to another church and preach a sermon there, a series of sermons, and I'd come back all pumped up. That was great, that was fun, let's do it again. He's like, Troy, don't you forget, Sunday comes every week. Yeah, of course it does. So does Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? No, Sunday's different. In the life of a preacher, it comes every week. And sometimes when Sunday comes around, whoever your preacher is, is feeling remarkably weak. Like we have nothing to offer. Like there is nothing I could tell you from this passage of Scripture that would do you any good. I have come to kind of enjoy those Sundays. i got to be honest with you, because those are the ones where people come up to me all week long afterwards and say, that was just what I needed. That was the most fantastic thing. Do you have that recorded? Like, why would I record that one? They're like, no, that was the one. Because when I'm weak, when you're not looking at me, you're hearing from him. 
just like what's happening at Asbury College. You're probably even following this in the news. They just had a chapel service, just a regular, everyday, required for credit chapel service. But you see, people had been praying, probably for years, that revival would come once again to the campus of Asbury College. And guess what it is? The Spirit of God is moving. He broke in on this chapel service. They didn't have a special speaker that day. You know, they hadn't contacted Billy Graham and had him come in. They didn't have the Hillsong worship band show up to lead worship. They just, they just got together and prayed. And look what the Spirit of God is doing. And people have come and seen what's going on and they've made comments like, there's no band. There's no smoke machine. It's only Jesus. It's just Jesus. And look what's happening on that campus. My concern now, though, is all of the evangelical leaders who are looking at this and who are going to try to duplicate it. They're going to go back to their own church and they're going to cancel all the special speakers and they're going to tell their instrumentalists to go home and they're going to put away the smoke machine and they're going to say, it's going to be just like Asbury College. No, it won't. Because they're doing it. The revival happened because that's what, that's what God did. And we can schedule or not schedule whatever we want. But as long as we're the ones doing the work, well, then I guess he just kind of doesn't have to. He's just going to let us. Think about Paul, who we've been talking about here for a long time as we worked our way through Romans and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Think about this guy going into Damascus. I think about this often. He was riding a horse on the way into his Damascus. That might not sound like much to you, but at the time, this was the ultimate symbol of strength, wealth, and power. He had letters from the high priest in Jerusalem for the people in Damascus. This guy had the authority to walk into the synagogue in Damascus and tell those Jewish people anything he wanted, and they had to listen to him. He had the soldiers to back it up. He went into Damascus with a message for them, a message that he was uniquely qualified to give. There was nobody more studied than Paul. Nobody had more PhDs in the Old Testament than Paul. Nobody understood how it all worked together better than him, and not a single other person in that place had met Christ face to face like he had. He was uniquely qualified to go into the synagogue in Damascus and tell them about Jesus. And he knew it. And when he walked into that synagogue, they said, oh my goodness, it's brother Saul from Jerusalem. He's got letters from the high priest. Everybody sit and listen. And he stood up and he said, I'm about to tell you the most amazing thing you've ever heard. That man Jesus that was crucified down in Jerusalem rose from the grave three days later and he is the Messiah. And what'd they do? How'd they respond? They ran him out of town. He left town in a garbage bin hiding for fear of his life. So, he went down to Jerusalem. There is no one more qualified to be a Christian at that moment than Paul. He went down to the church and he said, I'm here, and they said, no, you're not, and shut the doors. He went over to the synagogue and he said, I'm the rabbi, Saul the rabbi, and I'm here to tell you about Christ. And they tried to kill him. And he fled for fear of his life. Reminds me of Moses. You know, there was nobody more uniquely qualified to lead the people of Israel than Moses. I mean, he was a Hebrew. He was an Israelite, if you will. He was raised, though, in Pharaoh's palace. He was raised as the adopted son of the king. He was given training and education in all the areas, in in government, in history, in leadership, in warfare, in in how to make battle. He was given training in economics, in in everything, in, in being an ambassador to other nations. Everything that a prince might need, he was trained that way. The first 40 years of his life, he was set up to be a leader. I wonder if Pharaoh thought he had a real asset here. Because he had these Hebrew people that were really difficult to manage, but now he had a Hebrew leader trained in his way, in his house, that could go out and manage these people. When, when, when Moses went out to see the Hebrews at their work, there was no one more qualified to lead them 
than he. When he found that Egyptian beating one of his brothers, and he killed that Egyptian, his Hebrew brothers should have rallied around him. Yes, Moses, he's come to set us free. What'd they do? They ran him out of town. The only one qualified to be their leader, they ran him out of town for fear of his life. He went out into the desert for 40 years. Interesting, isn't it? Both he and Paul, who were more qualified to do the job God had called them to do than anyone before or since, both of them had to spend significant time in obscurity to be any good to God. Paul went and spent three years in the desert, seven years at home in Tarsus, making tents. Nobody even knew who he was. Nobody cared. Ten years in obscurity. Moses spent 40 years leading someone else's sheep through the wilderness before they could be any good to God. And I think it's because they had to learn something in their time in obscurity. And the thing they had to learn is what Paul's talking about here in chapter 12 in these verses 6 through 10. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. If, Paul, you're going to be any good to me, if you're going to be able to use your qualifications and your connections for me, then you're going to have to just leave those things aside and just let me do it, Paul. Moses, if you're going to be any good to me at leading the people of Israel, then you're going to have to set aside your training and your crown and your nice robes and your great capabilities, and you're going to have to let me do it. Interesting stuff. But why does it matter to us? It's a good question. Why does it matter to us? Well, I had came up with a couple of ideas. First of all, because we want to grow. I I don't I don't mean we want to put on weight. That's pretty easy to do. I mean we want to we want to grow in our Christ likeness. We want to connect with Christ. We want to be the kind of people that abide with Him. And as we abide with Him, and as we are connected to the vine, we want to grow in the fruits of the Spirit. We want to be His disciples. We want each one of us, including the ones who are not here today, we want us all to be absolutely on fire for Christ. So that every place we go, everyone we meet, looks at us and says, it looks like you have the answer to what I'm facing. I see joy in you and no joy in me. What is it you got? I know it's not money. I know it's not great position. I know it's not wonderful capability. What is it you got? And we want each to be able to say, listen, I have been with Jesus today. And look what he's doing in my life. We want to grow. Each one, I know, I know you want to grow because you're here. The people who used to come to church here, who didn't want to grow, don't come to church here anymore. Breaks my heart, quite frankly, because I wish they wanted to grow. You're the ones who want to grow. And because we want the church to grow. Because we want the church to be the kind of church that God has called us to be. We want to grow together in unity. Man, I saw some wonderful things yesterday at Shelley's funeral. It was really cool to see Julie reconnect with so many people that, you know, have moved away and those kinds of things, and some of the others of you as well. It was really neat to see just that moment of unity. We want to grow together in unity. We want to see people reconnecting once again with the church in unity. And we want to grow together spiritually we want to see revival in this church we want to see people lining the new kneeling benches once we finally get them made we want to see people calling on him we want to see hands raised in worship we want to see people deeply connected to christ as a community growing together and and we want to we want to run out of chairs We want to have so many kids up in the kids' room that we got to add a table and don't know where we're going to put it. We want to grow. And and one more thing, and that is because we really want to see stuff happen. You know, we get together every week and we pray for an hour. You really, if you're not joining us for that, you should join us. Uh, We have this new prayer room that's fantastic. 
We get together at 5 o'clock on Sunday evenings and we pray for an hour and we ask God to do things and we'd like to see those things happen. We'd like to see things happen. We'd like to see the people that we pray for by name finding Christ. We'd like to see the families that we pray for restored. We'd like to see things happen. We'd like to see things happen in our, our community around us. And none of these things will come to pass because we work really hard at it. This church has tried multiple evangelism techniques, real trendy ones. They didn't work. Many of you have told me, well, I, I tried this book or this discipleship material and it didn't work. Yeah. Some of you have told me, well, I talked to my neighbor about Jesus and he just slammed the door in my face. None of these things will happen because we make them happen. We're going to have to discover what Paul and Moses discovered. We're going to have to discover what Paul wrote about here in 2 Corinthians if it's going to make any sense to us. And so I, I broke it down because I am a preacher. I broke it down into three categories of things that, that Paul learned. And, and the first one is that you've got to rely fully on the power of God. You can't rely at all on yourself because when I am weak, then I'm strong. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, the spiritually bankrupt, those with no power or capability, those are the ones who get the kingdom of heaven. Those are the ones who see things happen. We must rely completely on the power of God. Easy to talk about, easy to say, yeah, brother, preach it on, harder to do. One of my favorite kings in the Old Testament is Jehoshaphat. You can go home and read about him. He's in uh, Second Chronicles and Second Kings. Fantastic guy, Jehoshaphat. Here was a guy whose heart was dedicated to God, who wanted to do the right thing, but had to learn it. He made some horrible mistakes. You know, Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah at a time that was really a, a political problem in, in, there in the Middle East. I mean, it was really hot politically in the Middle East at the time. And his nation was small and powerless, and he knew that he was going to have to do something to, to make it better. And one of the things he thought maybe he would do was get a navy. I mean, he's right there on the Mediterranean coast. He may as well have a navy like all the other nations. But he didn't have the money to have a navy. Plus, he didn't know anybody who could build a ship. So he teamed up with the little nation Israel to the north. They got together, and they made a navy together. And they got their whole navy, their whole flotilla together after they had put years of, of funds and, and training and all of these kinds of things into building this navy. They got the whole navy together, and they said, let's go to Tarshish. And they all got on their boats, and they all took off in the Mediterranean to go to Tarshish, and every single boat sunk on its maiden voyage. Gone. And Jehoshaphat says, what do I do? And he called on the Lord, and the Lord sent a prophet. And the prophet said, why did you team up with a wicked nation? Why didn't you just ask me? Later, later, a bunch of nations conspired against Judah. Now, the king had fortified all the cities in Judah. He built bigger walls, and he put better trained soldiers and better armaments and, 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 and better weaponry in all of these cities so that if these nations came, he'd be ready. The nations conspired against him, Moab and Ammon and a couple other nations off to the east, and they started coming to get him, and they were powerful. So powerful, they marched right through Edom. You guys have seen pictures of the uh, little city of Petra? You know, there in the Edom used to occupy that area. So imagine an army being able to just march right through there. I mean, they were strong and powerful, and they're coming to Judah. By now, Jehoshaphat has learned his lesson. He has learned that if he trusts in the walls he put around the cities, it's not going to do any good. If he trusts in the soldiers he put into the cities, they're not going to be capable. If he trusts in the weapons, they're not going to be strong enough. He knows that if this vast army comes to reach him there in Judah, it's over. And so he cries out to God and he says the most amazing thing. You guys should memorize this. He says, I do not know what to do, but I look to you. I... I, I am over my head. I don't know how to handle this. How am I going to get through this? I have no idea. There is no hope. And so, that's what that but there means. And so, because of the fact that there is nothing else I could possibly do, I look to you. Wait a minute. He's got big cities with big walls and lots of soldiers. He says, not good enough. The one I look to is you. 
oh, you've got to go read the story. It's amazing. They didn't even assemble an army. You know what they did? They brought a worship band together, and the other armies were completely defeated. You've you got to look it up. It's absolutely fantastic. I do not know what to do, but I look to you. You know what it reminded me of? When my daughter Kylie was about three, I don't think that Addie was born yet. I can't remember. Kylie had this little plastic truck, kind of like this one, but it wasn't a dump truck. That's much cooler. It was just, it was like a sedan, some dumb little thing. And it was the same kind here where, you know, the axles run under the plastic and sometimes the axles pop out. I was sitting in my chair in the living room and she brought it to me and sure enough, she'd been playing with it pretty rough and, and one of the axles was just fine, but the other axle, one side was popped in, the other side was popped out, so it was kind of dangling there and it wouldn't roll. And she brought it to me pretty upset that, she, that it was broken and she explained to me in her best, you know, almost three-year-old that it was broken and she needed me to fix it. And I said, okay. And she put it on my lap upside down so that I could see the broken axle. I said, okay, no problem. Super easy, right? You just pop that thing back in. So I reached down and picked it up and she said, no. I said, no, no. And she took it and she put it back down on my lap and she showed me this is what's wrong. This is what you need to fix. Okay. So I reached down and picked it up again. No. Back down on my, she's pointing, this is what you need to fix. As if she didn't understand that I knew what to do here. That it was going to require both hands, it was going to require it in my hands in order to fix this thing. And every time I would go to pick it up, her little scrubby little three-year-old hands would push it back down. And finally I said to her, Kylie, if you don't get your hands out of the way, I can't fix it. <sighs> if you know my daughter. Finally, she's like, and I took it and I fixed it and it was done. How many times do we do that same thing to God? We call on him, Lord, I'm having this problem. Here's what's wrong in my family, in my finances, in my life, in my health. Here's the problem, oh Lord, and I need you to fix it. And he says, okay, and we say, okay, now here's what you got to do. Here's how it's got to come together. Uh, listen, I'm going to stand here and you move over there. No, hands off. We have to fully rely on him. Not trust in our armies and our walls and our weaponry and our navy. Fully rely on him. That's the first thing I think that Paul learned is that as long as he's doing it, it ain't going to work. But if he relies on God, we got it. And then the second thing is you got to come to a point where you trust in the character of God. His character. What you know about him. His nature the kind of person that God is. You've got to get to the point where you know Him well enough that you understand enough about Him that you can realize that He is all love and all compassion and all mercy and that He loves you more than anything. Seriously, He gave His life for you. He moved heaven and earth for you. He, he came and, and created a whole new thing just so that you could be reconciled to Him in the new covenant. He loves you so much. Remember when Jesus was talking and he said, which of your sons, if he asks for bread, will give him a stone? Here, chew on that, boy. Which of your sons, if he asks for an egg, he's hungry, he's like, oh, I want some eggs. Which of you is going to give him a scorpion or a snake? Here, suck on that for a while. Not a one of you would do that. When your son has needs, he's hungry, they're basic needs, they need to be met, you're going to meet those needs. You're not going to pull a fast one and trick him try to harm him Jesus says imagine your heavenly father he loves you so much more than you even love your own son just just consider when you ask him for something that you need something that's good is he going to withhold that from you Paul says you know what I had a thorn in my flesh if you want to know what that is listen to the Wednesday night Bible study and you'll hear me tell you I don't know there was something that was causing Paul tremendous pain. It was making it difficult for him to get through the day. He went to God in three times, three specific times. I mean, I don't think that, I think this is one of those things a lot of times during the day he might have said, dear Lord, would you deal with this? But there were three very specific times where he probably spent all night in prayer on this one topic. Lord, will you take care of this for me? Will you remove from me this thing that's holding me back, that's causing me such pain? Three times. 
And the Lord said, no. Remember, Jesus in Gethsemane, three times he went before the Father. Would you take this from me? I really don't want to do this. Talk about a thorn. I really don't want to do this. I think we would all agree here that Father God loved Jesus. I think we'd all agree here that Father God listened to Jesus. I mean, remember the prayer outside of Lazarus' tomb. I think we'd all agree here that when Jesus prayed for something, Jesus got the best. Father, would you take this from me three times? God said no. We're going to have to come to the point where we understand the character of God well enough to realize that when he says no, there's a reason for it that's beyond anything we're going to understand. We've got to come to the point where we understand that his viewpoint is much better than our viewpoint. That he sees and knows and understands things that we don't see and know and understand. And when things come our way that we cannot handle, it's too much for us, take it away, O oh Lord. And he says no, that it's because he understands it's the best thing. Now, now, Jesus understood this. He knew that by dying on the cross and going to heaven, he was going to save us from our sins. Paul came to understand this. He came to understand that this thorn in his flesh, whatever that was, kept him from getting a swelled head. So he didn't walk around working in his own power again and failing. He had no power, no power, no failure. He could re rely on God. He came to appreciate this thing that was holding him back. He came to appreciate the pain he was dealing with. But then I think about Micah. Pastor Jerry's grandson, three years old. Look how we prayed for him when he got sick. Pastor Jerry's whole family, good Christian people following Christ from the day they were born. Whole family all over the Pacific Northwest praying for this little boy. All of the churches, the 80 however many churches there are in our area and then however many there are in the Northwest area, in the Rocky Mountain area, all of these churches, all praying for little Micah that he might be healed. And he wasn't. And he died. Three years old. Never did anything wrong to anybody. Three-year-old little boy. How in the world? Pastor Jerry talks about it much more broken up than I am. And he says, I don't understand. I, I don't know why God would do something like that. I don't know why God would say no. When we asked and we prayed and we pled with him, knowing that he is our good father who gives us good things that we need, why would he take away my grandson? Why would he do this to my children who who now have this hole in their family and will for the rest of their lives. Why would he do this? Why would he allow us to be hurt so much? I don't know, Pastor Jerry says. But I know whom I have believed it and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know. I don't understand why. I'm never going to be able to be like Paul and say, well, this is the reason. But I trust in the character of God. I know that he loves me more than anything. And if, and if this is going to have to be the way it's going to have to be, well, then I'm just going to fully rely on him. I can't fix it. Even if I could, it wouldn't do any good. Whatever he says is best, I'm just going to have to roll with that. And I'm just going to have to trust him until the end. We've got to learn to rely on him. We've got to learn to trust in him. And one more thing, we have to pursue the completeness of God. I've used that word completeness on purpose because it says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. That word perfected is the word teleos. Another place that you come across that word a lot, that you think about it a lot, is in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus is saying, that's nice that you love your friends. You're also supposed to love your enemies. Everybody is supposed to receive the same level of agape love, just like your father, where it says, be perfect, therefore, 
as your heavenly Father is perfect. That word perfect does not mean flawless. That word perfect is teleos. It means complete. Be complete. Be complete in your love. Love everybody the same way. Don't leave anybody out. Be complete. Teleos, same word. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is completed in your weakness. My power is made full, brought to its fullness in your weakness. Has it ever occurred to you that maybe the thing that holds you back is the thing that God wants to use? The thing that you've said, Lord, if I was just shorter or taller or skinnier or fatter, or if I was just louder or quieter or a more ambunctious personality or a more withdrawn personality, if I was a little bit smarter or maybe not so smart, if I talked a little more, if I didn't talk so much, then I know, Lord, that you would be able to use me greatly. Has it ever occurred to you that it might be that very thing that he plans on using? Let me tell you a little, quick little story. Her name is Gladys Allwood. She was born in England in 1902. Born to a working class family. She was unfortunately, at least in her mind, not very attractive. She was very short. Significantly shorter than five feet. We don't know exactly, but she was in the four foot something range. She had straight black hair. This was in a time when, if you were going to be attractive in Britain, you were tall, you were kind of uh, husky, and you had wavy blonde hair, or at least brown. Straight black hair. She was also kind of meek, but at the same time, ridiculously stubborn. To the point where her educators, her parents told her, you're never going to be able to be good at anything because you're just too stubborn. You're too tenacious. You won't give up when it's time to give up. When she was a teenager, she got a job as a housemaid, and she felt like Christ was calling her to be a missionary. So she went down to a local missionary society, and she applied there, and they gave her an interview, and they said, where would you like to go? And she said, I don't know, maybe China. And they said, you'll never make it. You'll never make it. You need to be bigger and stronger to make it in China. Plus, you really need to be married, and let's just be honest, nobody's going to marry you. It's not going to work. You're not going to make it. And they they turned her down, and they said no. And so she took her entire life savings, money she'd made being a housemaid, and she bought a ticket to China because she was stubborn. She got on a train to go to China, and this is really interesting because China and Russia were at war at the time. So she's riding through Siberia on a train. Where are you heading? China. She got detained. But she was so stubborn that she broke out of detainment and jumped on a Japanese trading vessel and rode on a boat the rest of the way into China. And when she got to the dock there in China, she looked out among the sea of people, and what do you suppose she saw? Short little women, four foot something, straight black hair, kind of meek, really stubborn. She fit right in. She gave the rest of her life until the Communist Party came in and kicked her out. She gave the rest of her life to telling people about Christ in China, to running orphanages in China. When the Communist people kicked her out, she went to Taiwan and did it there. She was remarkably capable for God. The very things that she had prayed, God, take these things from me. I need to be taller. I need wavy hair. I need to be a little less stubborn. The very things that she prayed for God to take away from her were the things that he said, no, those are the things I'm going to use to affect the world around me. We need to fully rely on him. We need to be able to trust completely in his character when we don't understand what's going on. And we need to understand that when I'm weak, that's when he's strong. His grace is sufficient for us. It's enough. We don't need anything else. Because in our weakness, that's when His strength comes through in completeness. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Maybe you think about the weaknesses of this church. The things we need to work on. We need more children running around upstairs. We need, I don't know, better kneeling benches. I really think we do. You see our weaknesses... He says, yeah, yeah, just wait, here I come. If we're fully reliant on him, if we're willing to accept his character and understand that what he gives us is just what we need. You know, this was just what I needed this week because we, we did Shelley's funeral. 
yesterday. So it was a hard week and a long week, and there were a lot of things going on, a lot of conversations to have, and a lot of people to cry with. And then, and then I got to thinking about how for four years, we prayed continuously that Shelley would be healed. I don't mean every now and then. I mean continuously we prayed that she would be healed. And we expected that to happen. And then I got to thinking about Peter before that for five years. Just as I was coming here, Peter was dealing with cancer and we prayed continuously that he would be healed. And they're both gone. And it's really easy to say, yeah, Jesus answered our prayers. He healed them eternally. They are healed. And that is true. These were people who loved Christ and clung to Him with everything that they were. I have no doubt that they're clinging to Him now. So it's easy to say, well, yeah, they've, they've been healed. But what about all those prayers we prayed? That something would happen. Something specific. And then it didn't. Well, that's when we trust in the character of God. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He worked out the story of Peter and Shelley's life much better than I ever could. He, he knows what he's doing. And if I rely on him and don't try to step into it and answer the questions that I can't answer and say things that I shouldn't say because I don't really know, which we're all tempted to do, if we just rely on him and say, well, Lord, you are the one in charge, and, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm just going to let you take care of it. And if we realize that those kinds of weaknesses just, just, might, just might be the thing he can use. We were down in Sweet Home and a lady passed away that had been an important part of that church for many, many years before that. You know, she was the organist and the whatever and all of that, you know. And the family was all broken up and we all got together and it was great. And I realized that pretty much nobody in that family knew Christ. This lady had, but pretty much nobody else. We got together and we put together a funeral and we prayed over them. And the most interesting thing happened after that time. One by one, each of the family members, in their own time, came to know Christ. First it was her daughter, the matriarch of the family, and then it was their grandchildren, and then it was their husband, and then it was, and it just kept going. Now, we might have said, Lord, why did you take such a faithful member of your flock that you could have left at the church for another 10 or 20 years to do great things? Because he had a better plan. And only when we rely on him completely and don't try to fix it ourselves, and only when we trust in him, and only when we say, Lord, go ahead and use my weaknesses. So as we close this morning, I'll pray for you and you'll have a moment to just consider your own situation and think about the things that you've been complaining to God about and the areas of weakness in your life. I'm not saying that everything, everything he's thrown at you, you know, he, he's made it hard for you. Uh, we live in a fallen world and, and bad things happen. Three-year-old boys die in our world. And I'm not saying this is what he said he founded since the beginning of time that we we're going to have a horrible life. What I am saying is the position that you're in is the one that he can use. Not the one you want to be in, but the position that you're in now. So let's take a moment and pray. Lord, I thank you.